pit that we just left, that line, that pump pumps over and it comes into that white pipe you see on the right hand side. That's the influent line to the digester. Right as you follow that around, you see the gray, the gray flanges in the, the part in the middle. That's a flow meter. So what that does is that reads the gallons per minute that's going into the digester as well as keeps the total throughout the day. So daily we go through here and calculate from the day before of how many, exactly how many gallons went in today. So that way we can keep track of, well, if our KW production is down but we have 140,000 gallons go in, well that kind of explains it. Or, you know, if, if the weather is dry like it is and our KW production goes up, well we can see by our gallons going down or vice versa. It just helps us keep a good track and record of how many gallons goes in. So it goes in there, the first chamber that it goes into, we call the acid chamber. It has, it has a bunch of heating elements in it. When the manure comes in, we try and get it up to 100 degrees as fast as possible. Once it reaches that 100 degrees, that's when the majority of the gas is produced. So the faster we can get it up there, the better we are. So in there's, yeah, twice as many or so heat exchangers in there. It'll leave that section. This digester is a U shape. It'll go all the way down to the end, bend the corner, and then come all the way back. It usually takes, depending on gallons, around 18 to 21 days to make that cycle. <sighs> on this particular site, I don't know, we want to get into superheat pasteurization. You can tell on that. Superheat <sighs> on this particular site, we're trying a, a new theory with making class A solids, and we'll go through the solids later. But once it comes out of the digester, it goes into two other chambers. One's called our superheat chamber, and one's called the pasteurization. What we do in those chambers is we take the 100 degree manure, put it in there, and try and heat it up as fast as we can to 140 degrees. When you heat it up to 140 degrees, you kill 90 some percent of the bugs that are left living in there. <clears throat> With doing that, the solids that come out after we separate it are considered class A solids where they're pretty much pathogen free. Pathogen free. And you can certify them as organic. So that's, that's a new experimental thing we're doing on this site where most sites when it comes out, it goes into a pit called the effluent pit and from there it goes straight to the separator. Go ahead. I got a question for you. When you, when you talk about you want to get the temperature up quick as you can to yep. 100 degrees yep. and for the better stuff, 140, and you, it goes through heat exchangers, what's the source of heat? That the source of heat we'll see in the engine room, but we call it the exhaust off the engine runs through a heat exchanger. Inside that heat exchanger, it's kind of a shell and tube design. So the, the exhaust goes through a whole bunch of little tubes and the water surrounds all those little tubes. So we take 800 degree exhaust and by the time it comes out it's about 200 degrees. So we try and use, that's all the heat we have for the digester. There's no other outside okay. sources. It's kind of like an after cooler. Kind of like an after cooler, yep. How did you heat it for the first cycle? If you didn't have that heat already, if you didn't have the exhaust, how did you it goes in right now at whatever temperature it's getting pumped in at. So it's going in at today probably 60 degrees. So in that first chamber, we take the heat from the engine and put it in there through all those heat exchangers. I mean, like the first time you started it. Though, yeah, so when, we started oh. it up, so when we started it up, what we do is we bring in a boiler. We burn it on diesel and then we uh, heat everything up in the digester to the 100 degrees and usually about 90 degrees to 95 degrees uh, it'll start producing that gas and then once we have enough gas that we can put that boiler from diesel, it's the same boiler, it's a dual fuel boiler, we can put it into biogas. So then we'll run it off the of biogas until we have enough gas produced that we can start running the engine. Does that boiler need a lot of maintenance because of its yeah, that, that's an ongoing thing too, is the maintenance on the boiler during that time. 
either before, during, and after. So it's ready for the next project. So how long does that process take to about the same time as it takes to put stuff through the digest at once? It, it all depends on what the temperature is on the outside, too. If we start in the middle of winter, it's going to take a long time. Right. Uh, I would say 25 to 30 days. Yeah, I was going to say three weeks, but yeah. Yeah, 25 to 30 days from when that first gallon of manure come, comes in to producing enough gas to run the engine or switch the boiler over. Does it, does it make the most methane when it's fresh or when it's farther down the line? The fresher manure we can get in, the more gas we'll get out of it. As the manure sits on the slabs, it'll release that methane and then, then you so can't as it, collect it. As it goes on, the, the production goes yep. down. Yeah, as it goes on, the production goes down, and that's why we found that about that 21 day retention time, there's hardly anything left in it to try and collect. Go ahead. Any question about, you said you're, you're starting a new thing now to basically turn the waste for it to be certified organic, yep. and that not all digesters have that stuff. Correct. Is there, is that because it's a new technology, or is that because it's prohibitively expensive to add that extra bit to make it, it organic, or to have it yeah. be called organic? Yeah. Like, what's the... It's a new technology that Angar and DVO and the other manufacturer of digesters are working on. As fertilizers on certified organic farms. Correct. It, it could be classified as a peat moss replacement. So instead of your your bags of peat moss that you buy in the store to plant your plants, it could actually be right. cow so manure. They, they could pull it out, bag it, and sell it as a correct. Like at a home and garden store. Almost. Correct. Yeah. yeah. The biggest thing is is like the biggest organic certifier is Omri. You know, they're based out of Oregon. And they don't recognize a plug flow digester as a uh, certified organic for pathogen reduction. Uh, even though we're in for 22 days, we can test our manure even without pasteurization, and we're in the 99% uh, kill rate, but they still won't recognize as that. So we, that's why we've added the, the extra chamber to do the Class A biosolids for pasteurization heat. Uh, so we can heat it up to 140 degrees, and we know that it's got to be in there for eight hours to recognize that as Class A biosolid. So that's the big thing too. How big of a game changer is that being able to get the plug flow digester to spit out certified organic solids? Is that going to be a big selling point, or is that just kind of a a small? Well, this is another benefit too. Benefit. Yeah, it, it it will be huge, but right now we've been working on that market to sell those class the the aftermarket solids to different nurseries and different other byproducts and selling it and bagging it. But at this point, that market's not there yet. Once that market does come, that'll be a big sell. That'll point. be huge. Okay. Wait, are you selling it currently? Um, is it is it matter that it's organic? Is it are you, or are you paying to to dispose of it? No, we're not paying to dispose of it. So it's, it's not extra cost on your company. Right. So right now, the bedding that comes off the digester vessel, he'll get to that. Basically, 50% of that bedding will be used on the dairy for bedding of the animals. So they're not having to buy sawdust. So that's a reduction in cost. They don't have to buy sand. So that's a reduction in cost. The other 50%, you can either sell to neighboring dairy for bedding, or you could, and most time, like Edeline, they keep it all in house and they'll spread it on the farm as a natural fertilizer. At the end of the whole process, don't you guys have phosphorus too? We do. The, the digester does not take out any of the, the chemical makeup of the manure. I mean, we take out the methane of it, but you still have the nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus still in the manure. Now, some of that nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium will, when after the separation process, some of that will go with the solids. Not a huge amount, but some of it will. So you guys separate that out extra for fertilizer? We are working on new technology with that also. Yeah, that guy from Wazoo last week was telling us about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Craig? And that's over at Vanderhawks, the other site where we started at. 
there's there's an add-on to the digester which we're working on trying to do that. Get a dryer or something, right? Well, you're trying to remove the ammonia out of it and then you make an ammonia sulfate, which is a concentrated fertilizer. You guys are like learning as you go kind of, right? Yeah. It's all so brand new. Yeah. It's all, it's all a new technology. Yeah. How much cooperation do you need from the farmers? Like somebody, you can make it work in the lab, but how much, how hard has it been to have a farm willing to take on the challenge of something that you're kind of building as you go? Um, the technology of the digester is, is old technology. Right. Um, but like these add-ons are old. The add-ons are a hard, they're a hard sell um, until you can prove them. At this point, over at Vanderhawks, Angar has fronted a lot of the money, and along with WSU and along with other developers and companies interested in it. So there's been very little cost to the farmer. Uh, most farmers you'll find are not going to say, here, here's $100,000, <laughs> go play with it. Right, because like, I know there's a relationship in this area between yeah. WSU and some of the farms. And Correct. Like the agricultural programs and stuff, but how, like I guess that's fairly, having that relationship there is fairly critical yeah. to the development of this industry. Yeah, yes. yeah. Vanderhawks have been w very willing to work with us and using their facility it's kind of a test facility so that's where we do most of the trials and experiments um, so our relationship with them has been been great to work with wouldn't you say that Daryl is kind of more willing to do it than other dairy farmers because he's kind of an entrepreneur himself. yeah 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 you know, he's he always looks at other things yeah you know? Daryl Daryl Vanderhoek always looks for investments or he's always looking for what the future brings and so that's why he's it's another reason why he's been willing to allow us to do some of these trials. Do you foresee a lot of anaerobic digesters coming into this area? Um, into this area is a little bit more difficult because um, because of multiple multiple factors. Is feasibility studies on farms big enough? Uh, Vanderhawks is the smallest digester we have. They're milking around 800 cows, or I think they're total 800 with. I think they're milking about 600 and have about 200 head of, of dry cows. So that's the smallest one we have. A lot of the big dairies in this area are, or have gone out, or you know just not wanting to do it. But there is a lot of potential for growth in other areas down in Oregon, Eastern Washington, where the, the farms are larger, Idaho, think people are and, going to jump on board and also yeah and also in california especially okay. if we can get the nutrient management figured out then that's a whole game changer with with how farmers actually fertilize their fields and what they do with their manure and that nutrient recovery system is has only been proven on our digesters themselves so you couldn't i mean i mean you i'm not saying you couldn't but it's been proven and so basically that nutrient recovery system would have to go with our digestive system. Is there any questions? I know the digester, you, you can't see inside of it, but inside of it, it's pretty much a, a storage tank. I believe this one is almost 1.4 million gallons. Um, all you have inside of it is on, on the interior walls, there's, there's heat exchangers where we collect, like I said, the heat off the engine and pump it through there. And then we also take gas. Uh, this is our main gas line, this yellow one coming in the building. We take the gas that we need and ship it back into the digester and that's what we use to stir inside. So it's kind of like a free agitator pretty much because we take a product that we already have, introduce it back into the digester to keep all the solids suspended so that they can travel through the digester and make it the, make it their way out. It's tough to keep it separate, you know, the oldest from the newest. <laughs> What's that? Keep the, you know, the, the manure separate. You got your newest stuff and then your oldest stuff. You're mixing it, but it's not like mixing thoroughly, right? The, the mixing factor in here, the way the mixing works is it works in just a circle. Oh, okay. So it's working in a circle and as you pump manure in it just keeps that circle moving down 
So and then as it, it's almost like a screw. It just it works its way down and then all the way around. So that's the advantage of the plug flow is that you know you get your retention time. Correct. It's not like it's all getting mixed together in there. It's kind right. of flowing through stages. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's it's not it's not real when when we agitate in there it's not real violent. It's just a slow slow yeah. circular motion. Just enough to keep it in suspension yeah. and settle out. Yeah. <clears throat> on top of here, on this site we have four different zones. Each zone has a temperature probe in it. That temperature probe reads the temperature of manure inside the digester. When it says, hey, I'm at 98 degrees, I need heat, it'll turn on a pump inside, which we'll see in a little bit. That pump will run and supply heat to the digester until it meets that 100 degrees and it'll shut off. So that's how we keep a constant temperature inside there. How much of um the heat off the engine or your system is utilized by just the digester's needs? Uh, at this facility with the superheat pasteurization, I would say we're up to 98% or so of the heat that we, can, that we can scrub off the engine we use. Any excess heat that we don't use comes into this radiator right here and the fans will come on and, and we just get rid of the heat. Over at Vanderhawk's site, with, with not having the, these additional pits, we don't quite use all the heat, but we take that heat and send it in the form of hot water up to the house up front and also the barn for heat inside the barn. So we try and utilize as much of the free heat as we possibly can. Oh, like the barn for the animals or the well, barn for storage? Or? There's, there's actually a basketball court upstairs in that barn. So there's heat up there for that. <laughs> so. So I mean, how comfortably, how, how, what temperature can you maintain a large open building with, with uh, that 200 degree water? Nah, uh, it de probably depend on the building. That one's not insulated at all, but we can raise the temperature of the building 10 degree, 10 to 15 degrees, pretty easily. Okay. Yeah, I hold my kids' basketball practice in there, and we turn on maybe an hour before we get there yeah. and they start playing and they complain that they need to turn it off. So it heats up pretty good. Yeah. Over in different climates like Idaho where we have sites, they run engine heat to all their all their buildings or, in, or all their equipment is inside like the separator and that kind of stuff because yep. it gets so cold and things freeze up. So they take their engine heat, run it in to heat those buildings. So we always try and use the most of what we have. Yep. And there's other sites that run the hot, the extra hot water to the parlor, so they're yep. not having to pay for propane or natural gas yep. to heat water. Yep. Is this not a flexible roof, or are you guys getting let it pump into a tank? No, it's a solid concrete tank. On on top of this lid is a, a 12 inch hollow core, and then there's four inch, three and a half inch solid concrete slab on top of that. So it can take quite a bit of pressure. It can take a fair amount of pressure, yeah. But that's that's weight down, not weight inside lifting you up. Got like a, you have a butterfly valve there, that's what you open to get the methane to start flowing out? Or? <sighs> no, that valve right there is just for a secondary mixing in oh, these okay. other two pits. Yeah, all the gas comes through this yellow pipeline. Yeah. So, so what, what kind of, uh, so on a million and a half gallon digester, what kind of gas are you getting? What kind of CFM? Gas are, yeah. It depends. Right now I'm averaging about 170 CFM. Okay. How much, um, is there any uh, kind of back of envelope calculation on the size of digester versus um, CFM. Mike would know that CFM per cow. I'm more thinking about like if you're going to build, because you know, we're going to be building a, a small lab digester, and I'm just curious if there's any back of the envelope calculation on the size of the digester that you make versus the amount of gas that it produces. No, you're going to no. get the same with the yeah. digester system. The size is based on the cow count versus the gallons. 
So you take the farm size, figure out how many gallons a day a cow will produce, and then try and get your 21 day retention time. So that's kind of how you, how you figure it. Okay. And then your CFM can depend, like Andy talked in the beginning with the whole nutrition. Yep. Different dairy could add feed different items, which would be either higher in methane or lower in methane. Right, or if they're getting a lot of fog or yep. other materials. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so these guys so, take in the outside um, feed stocks? Substrates? Yeah. As of now, no. We'll kind of go through that a little bit if we head back to Vanderhoek's, but as of right now, this, this pit was built for substrates and they did a little bit in the beginning. But right now, that facility right there is their calf barn facility. So it, all the wastewater from there is piped over into this pit and then gets pumped into the digester. <clears throat> the reason they did that, there's not a lot of value in this for us because it's mostly water. But the neighbors all complain because of the calf manure stinking so bad. That, so once we pipe it through the diet or pump it through the digester, the odor is greatly decreased. So they must have a nicer um, end product if they're not taking in fats, oils, and greases and Correct. stuff like that. Correct. A lot of the substrates will break down the, in the digester. Some of the fats, oils, and greases need a longer retention time to break down. Oh, so. Okay. So if you see that, so some because some of the some of the digesters you get see kind of like a shiny and sometimes it, the manure uh, the, the, the final, final product is a little bit clumpier you yeah. know so if you had a longer retention time you think that that would still that would be able to all get you'll taken be care able to break down those fats how much longer does a fat oil and greases take versus manure oh it all depends which what, what the, you put in at what volume all well, right right yeah. right but I mean just give me a uh, do they take like twice as long, a third longer, generally, I mean, just like a, a broad. Uh, I can't answer. Yeah. All right. I yeah. don't know. Okay. I don't know. There's, there's too many variables associated with that. Okay. Go ahead. Is there anything else that goes in here besides manure? Like, nope. you, have, you don't have anybody, like, paid to dump this Not on this site currently. So you think that would really help with being able to have a organic cert on the end because you really know what's going into it. Correct. Correct. Yep. Is there any more? Qu Go ahead. So what percent of the biogas is used to like run the system and what percent about is like exported for electricity? 100% of the biogas is used on this facility. We produce, like I said earlier, around 170 CFM of biogas. The engine takes all of that to produce power. So with that 170 roughly CFM, we produce an average of between 400 and 450 and 550 kW. All of that power comes back through this transformer and it's being shipped straight back to the grid. In turn, we buy back from PSE the power we need to maintain the facility. How much power is that? Mike, do you know? Oh, for this uh, facility? Yeah. For it's a, usually about 6% of your total K-dub that you produce is what we would use on this site. So the paras parasitic load for this would be 500 kilowatts, 6% 6 of 500 kilowatts. 25 K-dub a year? Yeah, 25 to 30 K-dub is what we'd use on site per hour. Sure. Does Angar make biomethane? Biomethane. Uh, Bring it up to like pipeline or... spec. Or... Uh, not currently, no, we are not. There's plans in the future to maybe try and do that, but as of now, we have not. We don't have any sites that do that. And that's the huge push right now with the government is the vehicle fuel. So either natural gas, but the big push right now is RNG, renewable natural gas. So digesters will play a big role in that, right. coming down the pipe. Uh, scrubbing or something? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. We wouldn't be in the technology of scrubbing, just because it'd be kind of like the engine itself. We don't, we buy the engine outright, gotcha. you know, from a supplier right. that brings it in. We would do that same with the- Another, another add-on, right? It, yeah, yeah, so instead of putting the engine in, you would put the scrubbing technology in with the fueling station to do it that way. 
the experiments going that you're trying in Vanderbilt? Are they good? Very well. We've we have proven the nutrient recovery system at Vanderhawks, and since then we have installed it on a different, newer site down south. So, and it's it's proven to be very well, very good there, and very productive. And then our uh, technology provider, which is BBO uh, Incorporated, which is out of Chilton, Wisconsin, they put one on uh, a poultry farm in, in Ohio. That one has been running very well also, and then since then they've installed uh, another one on another side. So they're, they're, they're coming along. You know, Everybody has to the, see multiple that, operations working before people are willing to take the jump and say, oh yeah, I'm yeah. going to invest. It's a big investment. Yeah, X yeah. amount of dollars. And, yeah. Is that is that Craig's design? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's uh, Craig's design with the help of Angar and DBO. The guest Angar and DBO put in a lot of their own money to uh, develop further development. Yep. Are either do either of you guys work on kind of the development of that system as well, or he does? Uh, <laughs> I do the all the operations and maintenance on it. So, and then if we we play, spend a lot of time fighting little problems we've had with it. Yep. Trying, okay, this is the problem we have, how are we gonna fix it? And trying different experiments to try and fix it. Have you guys had any luck with kind of the black phosphorus goop for for processing it on more or drying it or uh, how to deal with that? Or? With the, the fine solids, the phosphorus yeah. fine solids coming out, we have not spent a whole lot of time with that. As of now, it goes through a settling lane, which we can see over there. The phosphorus solids drop out, but it's a matter of trying to get those dried to the point of handling, which is... You know, I, I, had, a, I had a thought on that. I was thinking about that after uh, Craig's presentation. Um, in the um, oils business, when you're uh, with oils, there's a process called uh, degumming, where you're taking out all the phospholipids, and you get this black, phosphorusy, sticky, yucky goop yep. that's kind of similar. I mean, the technology exists for dealing with the, that product. It makes a product called less of it. You know, you could probably go to potentially, which is really just a phosphorus sticky material, you could probably use some of the technology for a lecithin processing to make like a technical grade yeah. spec yeah. with that. And just Then you've got standard industrial equipment that's yeah. on the market for it. Yeah, yeah there, is, there is separation equipment that, we, that you can use yep. to try and get it out, but to try and make all these products sellable, you want as less load on the system as possible. So if yep. you can do it without using any power or any energy, then it's always more appealing to the, everybody else. Yep. So. And then you run into that capital cost again. Yeah. You know, how much is it going to cost based on your return? You know, at Nature Recovery System now, they want to make it that uh, how much acid you use, basically, and how much ammonia you make, that it'd be a, basically a neutral project. Gonna make any money, but you're not gonna lose any money. Okay. That's their their biggest deal right now. Right. Just so at least you, you're not losing money, but you got a, a more usable uh, yes. nutrient that you can yep. either yep. chip further out or sell. Or sell. Yep. 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 Okay, so we'll from here we'll move into the engine room. Um, it's gonna be really hard to talk in there, so we'll maybe I'll let everybody kind of do a walkthrough and just kind of look at everything, see see what you have, what we have in there. Uh, we have a Guascore engine pushing about a thousand fifty horsepower to a generator capable of putting out seven hundred fifty kW. Um, on the back of the engine is called a heat recovery skid. That's where we collect all the exhaust off the engine to heat our water. That hot water runs over into you'll see an elevated old milk tank in there. That's our hot water storage. From that hot water storage, you'll see if you trace the green pipes out, they'll run down to the floor. And then on this back wall, you'll see a whole series of pumps. Those are all our heating zones for inside the digester. Like I talked earlier, the probes on, on top of the digester come back to a central control panel, which say, hey, I'm, I need heat or I don't need heat. And that's what turns on those pumps. As we work this way a little bit in that room, you'll see two plate coolers. We run all the gas 
that comes off the digester through these plate coolers. What we try and do is drop as much moisture out of the gas as possible to get the driest fuel to the engine instead of trying to ship wet gas to it, which it won't, won't burn real well. Um, so on this site, there's a new technology with using two sets of plates. Um, we actually use, it'll go in one side, drop out a bunch of water, go through another plate cooler, which is, which is cooled again by this chiller standing right behind us. And then we'll take that cooled gas and make another pass back through to try and utilize the cold gas that we have to drop out even more water. Um, to this side of that, there's, there's a bigger motor, I believe it's a 15 horse motor running a blower. That's our gas recirc blower, which we use to stir inside the digester. Also, we have a gas booster inside the digester, runs about three inches of water column. It takes 28 inches of water to produce one PSI. So at three inches isn't enough pressure to feed the engine. The engine pre-regulator pressure is normally around 30, and then we're around 15 inches of water after the regulator of, of feeding it to the engine. So we try and take that, that three inches of water pressure and change it up to about 30. That's what wow. we do with the gas booster. Order of magnitude more. Yeah. So, um, one thing, if, if there's any opportunity in there, I know that siloxane is kind of a, a real pain in the, the bottom on um, for the generator and just getting in, in all the valves and stuff like that. Um, do you, uh, when we're in there, it'd be great if we could get a, a photo or uh, if there's any if there's any parts that have got some of that material on it. Of uh, what? Do you, siloxane? Do you have to deal with that at this facility or is that, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, Silicon based, it's like a powdery, wet powdery. I know down at like um, Qualco they've got a problem with siloxane. Um, and a lot of the anaerobic digesters have that. Uh, that's the H2S? The H2S. No, not, no, not H2S. No, um, siloxane, it's, um, it's a silicon type substance. It's kind of a powdery. It gets on all the valves and stuff. It's, it's a common. Um, on the engine? Yeah. Uh, you, just from the combustion gases running through the valves, or yeah, it's one of the byproducts of uh, anaerobic digestion. I mean, I okay. know they've got that problem at Qualco, and I've seen a number of other digesters that, that have that. Maybe it's because they're taking in a more variety of feedstocks. Yeah, but... possibly. Um, I mean, we do all the work at Qualco too, and not sure. I mean, you, I... you get build up on the valves, yeah, and on all the valve seats and the output of the valves will get filled up there. Um, all of the sites are gonna be the same as far as that based on runtime. Yeah. Um, I don't really have anything to show That's okay. for that, but. Okay. Um, this engine was put in in August of last year, so it's not quite a year old. We got about 8,000 hours runtime on it. These sites are designed to run 24 seven. If if they shut down at two o'clock in the morning, my phone goes off and I got to get out here to figure out what the problem was, get it restarted as soon as possible. Go ahead. How far do you travel to the other digestion? Can you take all the way to Oregon? Yeah, we have sites. We're based in Angar's based in Ferndale. We have a a branch over in Idaho. This uh, the Ferndale site. We take care of Sunnyside. We have, over in Eastern Washington, we have three in this county, one in Skagit County, one down in Monroe, one down south of Seattle, and two in Tillamook, Oregon. You tra you tra we traveled, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, one in South one? Seattle, the, the King County Sewage Treatment? What's that? The King County Sewage Treatment? No. No, we have another one down there. It's, it's in Enumclaw, wow. is where it's located. What's the lifespan on one of these? Like, how long does a generator engine have to be? The generator is, or the engine is, is designed to be totally rebuilt from the ground up. Every 10,000 hours, we'll go through and replace heads on it. Every 30,000 hours, we'll do a top end rebuild. So you do heads, um, pistons, liners, and connecting rods. So the life expectancy on it, there really isn't one because everything is designed to be rebuilt. 
does this whole place just shut down and wait, or do they just get a brand new engine in that? No, we work from 6 o'clock in the morning till 2 o'clock usually the next morning to get it up and going. So it just stops? Yeah, everything stops. No yeah. backup. No backup. 